Welcome back to the hangar on a rather windy Wednesday, the 10th of April. My name is Juan Brown. You're watching the Blanco Lirio channel. And today we're going to go over some of the many questions that you have on the preliminary report regarding the crash of the Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 that went down on the 10th of March. As is the nature of most preliminary reports, these reports often tend to lead to more questions than they do answers. So today we're going to go through from a pilot's perspective what the crew of Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 did correctly according to Boeing procedures for the new 737 MAX and what they didn't do correctly or missed altogether. I've been flying for about 40 years, civilian, military and airline pilot flying, currently 20 years with a major airline here in the United States, first officer on the Boeing 777. When the Ethiopian authorities first reported their preliminary report, they said that the pilots or the crew of Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 did everything correctly and yet the plane still crashed. And the fourth one is the crew performed all the procedures repeatedly provided by the manufacturer but was not able to control the aircraft. It's going to take accident investigators over a year to completely get to the bottom of this accident, and yet, with incomplete data, already lawsuits are flying. These two accidents are having a very large impact at Boeing aircraft. The production line for the Boeing 737 MAX line of aircraft is already slowing down, and we'll discuss in a future update what Boeing is doing to get in compliance with the Emergency Airworthiness Directive that is out on the 737 MAX series of aircraft. And what's so sad about this accident is the crew came very close to saving this aircraft. The single biggest question everybody had after reading the preliminary report was what was up with the throttles? How come the throttles were never reduced? What was the state of the auto throttle system? We'll talk more about human factors that investigators will be looking at that may come into play with this investigation here in a couple of minutes. But first, let's look at the procedures themselves. Following the crash of the first Boeing 737 MAX aircraft in Indonesia, an emergency airworthiness directive was issued by the Federal Aviation Administration, giving crews guidance on how to deal with a runaway stabilizer trim condition as caused by an MCAS anomaly. That came out in AD number 2018-23-51. In the event of an uncommanded horizontal stabilizer trim movement combined with any of the following potential effects or indications resulting from erroneous angle of attack AOA input, the flight crew must comply with the runaway stabilizer procedure in the operating procedures chapter of this manual. That procedure has been around for years, but here's the additions. Continuous or intermittent stick shaker on the affected side only, Minimum speed bar, red and black, on the affected side only. Increasing nose down control forces. IAS disagree alert, that's indicated airspeed disagree alert. Alt disagree alert, altitude disagree alert. AOA disagree, if that option's installed, that's angle of attack disagree. This option is located here on the flight instrument display. Field diff press light, that's differential field pressure light. Autopilot may disengage, and you may be unable to re-engage the autopilot or engage the autopilot. Reading through the preliminary report, it sounds like our crew had nearly all of these indications, except, of course, the optional option that they didn't have of the AOA disagree light. And then the guidance of what to do follows. Disengage autopilot and control airplane pitch attitude with control column and main electric trim as required. In other words, fly the airplane with the control column and use the uh, main electric trim on the yoke. If relaxing the control column causes the trim to move, st set the stabilizer trim switches to cut out. If runaway continues, hold the stabilizer trim wheel, the manual trim wheels, against rotation and trim the aircraft manually. Note. 
The 737-8-9 uses a flight control computer command of pitch trim to improve longitudinal handling characteristics. This is MCAS. In the event of erroneous angle of attack input, the pitch trim system can trim the stabilizer nose down in increments lasting up to 10 seconds. In the event of an uncommanded nose down stabilizer trim is experienced on the 737-8-9 in conjunction with one or more of the indications we previously discussed, do the existing flight manual runaway stabilizer trim procedure ensuring that the stab trim cutout switches are set to cut out and stay in the cutout position for the remainder of the flight. Why is it so important that stabilizer trim cutout switches remain in cutout? So that you do not reintroduce the problem back into the aircraft. You do not allow the MCAS to the MCAS system to be re-engaged to take over again once again the trim of the aircraft. Initially, higher control forces may be needed to overcome any stabilizer nose down trim already applied. Electric stabilizer trim can be used to neutralize control column pitch forces before moving the stab trim cutout switches to cutout. Manual stabilizer trim, that's with the, with the manual trim wheels, manual stabilizer trim can be used before and after the stab trim cutout switches are moved to cutout. And of course, let me remind you that manual trim wheels is going to be the only way that you're going to regain control of the trim of the aircraft once you've set the switches to cut out. Again, here's the manual trim wheels in the 737 with the retractable handle to gain additional leverage. And the stab trim cutout switches located on the forward pedestal in between the two manual trim wheels. According to the preliminary report, it appears the crew got the stabilizer trim cutout switches to cut out at approximately two and a half minutes after takeoff. It's these final paragraphs in the report before the recording ended that indicate that the crew reinstated the stabilizer trim cutout switches. The position of the stabilizer trim cutout switches are not recorded on the data recorders. However, the data here suggests that MCAS once again got a hold of the pitch trim of the aircraft at 054320. So the Emergency Airworthiness Directive gives us some guidance as to what the symptoms of an MCAS anomaly may very well look like. A series of warning lights, maybe a stall shaker, and intermittent nose down trim. Now let's go look at the age-old stabilizer, runaway stabilizer trim procedure that's been in the manual for years. Runaway stabilizer, condition. Each of these emergency procedures starts with a condition statement. What's the condition of the aircraft? What, the, what are the symptoms? Con condition, uncommanded stabilizer trim movement occurs continuously. Well, the Emergency Airworthiness Directive explains that for an MCAS anomaly, it may be intermittently. Step one, control column, hold firmly. Step two, autopilot, if engaged, disengage. Do not re-engage the autopilot. Control airplane pitch attitude manually with control column and main electric trim as needed. In other words, fly the aircraft. Step three, auto throttle, if engaged, disengage. Do not re-engage the auto throttles. Step four, if the runaway stops after the autopilot is disengaged, end of checklist. Step five, if the runaway continues after the autopilot is disengaged, stab trim cutout switches both cut out. If the runaway continues, stabilizer trim wheel grasp and hold. Step six, stabilizer trim manually using the manual pitch trim wheels on either side of the pedestal. Step seven, anticipate trim requirements. It's going to be very slow to manually trim the aircraft and you're going to have to anticipate your needs, any, any power changes. Step six, step eight, checklist complete except for deferred items. And the deferred items get you ready for your descent checklist and your landing checklist. Aviate, navigate, communicate, maintain aircraft control, analyze the situation, and land as soon as conditions permit. These are some of the things that are beat into you as a very young pilot 
throughout your entire career. And in a highly automated commercial type aircraft, you need to quickly reduce the level of automation to a understandable level of hand flying rather quickly to begin to get a grasp on the situation. So step two of the stabilizer runaway trim procedure according to the manual has you turn the autopilot off. It appears that the crew of the Ethiopian flight tried to engage the autopilot several times, perhaps initially before they even knew they had a problem. Step three, auto throttle disengage. This is the big one. According to the preliminary report, the throttles of Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 was set at takeoff power setting and never moved throughout the entire flight. This is going to present a lot of questions to investigators as they try to determine what mode were the auto throttles in throughout this entire flight. Typically when you depart, you set the throttles to the predetermined power setting for this particular departure and engage the auto throttles. The auto throttles then manage your throttles through the entire flight until which time you come down to land and you typically kick them off and flare and land. Unless you're going to do some hand flying of the aircraft, complete hand flying of the aircraft with the auto throttles and autopilot off. Typically hand flying the aircraft in these airliners means autopilot off, auto throttles on. So we become very used to working with the auto throttles and we become very complacent that the auto throttles will always comply with the speeds that, that we have set into the program and that they'll always work for us. Why did the crew of Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 never move the throttles? Why did they not notice that their speed was getting so out of control beyond red line? Well, this gets into the human factors parts of the equation that investigators are going to be looking at. And it's an unfortunate part of human nature, pilots are humans, that when they are startled, when they are surprised, when they are frightened, your vision gets reduced down to a very narrow tunnel of vision. Tunnel vision, including tunnel hearing as well. That narrow view of the world, focusing on pitch control of the aircraft, may very well exclude the throttles just out of your reach. That may very even exclude your airspeed just off to your left there. As you are so focused on trying to fight the pitch control of this aircraft, What's the best antidote for this, for this tunnel vision? Working together as a crew, one pilot needs to take charge of the situation to declare that he has the aircraft, he has control of the aircraft, and he needs to direct the other pilot to the correct procedure so that the other pilot can get started on fixing the aircraft while the first pilot flies the aircraft. So this requires the pilot flying the aircraft to take control of the aircraft and set a pitch and power setting that will maintain control of the aircraft and not allow the speed to get away from them. Once somebody takes charge of the situation and the other pilot begins fixing the problem, all that startledness backs off and your training, years and years of training begin kicking in and you almost automatically begin doing that which is required to resolve the emergency situation. And that's the key to this particular emergency, is a quick resolution of getting the stab trim cutout switches cut out and regaining control of the aircraft. If you can do that quick enough, you can take a runaway stabilizer trim situation and turn it into nearly a non-event. Once the aircraft begins getting severely out of trim, you've created a whole world of problems. So two crucial things the crew of uh, Ethiopian Flight 302 did not quite do according to the procedure. One is auto throttles off or get at least control of the throttles. And two, the crew went off the book, went off the procedure towards the very end of the recording and decided to re-engage the stabilizer trim cutout switches in an effort to regain some control of the trim of the aircraft because at the speed that they were going, 
because they never did anything with the throttles, they found that manual controlling of the trim of the aircraft was virtually impossible. Once they turned the stabilizer trim cutout switches back on, they were able to regain some electric trim in the nose up direction. But as soon as they let go of that electric trim on the yoke, after a five second pause, the MCAS system took over and nose dived the aircraft into the ground. Note two, at over 500 knots indicated airspeed, that's probably faster than any 737 MAX aircraft has ever gone before. So they're beginning to experience other aerodynamic phenomenons with such high speed flight, such as transonic flow over the flight control surfaces. And this is something investigators will be looking at closely. So as you can see, an accident investigation involves a long series of events that need to be investigated that led up to the accident. We have a lot of different questions about a lot of different things involving why do we even have the MCAS system? How did he get certified? And what are they going to do to fix it? We'll be covering all that in future updates, and I hope this gives you a little better understanding from a pilot's perspective as to what the procedures are for the 737 MAX series of aircraft runaway stabilizer trim and MCAS anomaly procedures are. See you here.